In May 2008, University of Nottingham student Rizwan Sabir and staff member Hisham Yeza were arrested for suspected involvement in terrorist activity in a case which many say raises issues about civil liberties and academic freedom. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Absent Justice with me, Ma'azam Beg. The arrests of the two men came after staff had found an English copy of the Al-Qaeda training manual on a computer and notified police. Both men were arrested and then released seven days later after it became clear that the document was used for research for a university course and that neither had any other connection to terrorism. The case was complicated by the fact that one of the two, Hisham, was re-arrested on immigration charges immediately after his release. But thanks to an international campaign of support, Hisham won his case against the Home Office in 2010. We will be discussing this and more about uh, the case and its implications in a few minutes. But first, here's a report by Huria Al-Haddad. The picturesque Nottingham University is hardly a place one would associate with terrorist activity. But it was here in May 2008 that a member of staff and a master's student were arrested and detained for seven days after senior managers informed the police about Al-Qaeda-related material found on a university computer. The material in question was the Al-Qaeda training manual, which student Rizwan Sabit had obtained from a US government website for academic research. The document was later found on the office computer of university staff member Hisham Yeza. Hisham was an acquaintance of Sabir and had been approached by the student to advise him on drafting his PhD proposal on radical Islam. Despite numerous university advisers insisting the materials were directly relevant to Sabir's research, both men were held for a week under the Terrorism Act, accused of downloading the materials for illegal use. They were released and uncharged seven days later, but Hisham, who is Algerian, was immediately re-arrested on unrelated immigration charges, in a move described at the time as an attempt to cover up the initial wrongful arrests. Thanks to an unprecedented international campaign, Hisham successfully won his case in 2010. Well, joining me in the studio to discuss this case is Hisham Yaza himself. He is now a writer, an academic and editor-in-chief of Ceasefire magazine. We are also very pleased and happy to have with us uh, Rizwan Saber. He is now a doctoral researcher at the Department of Social and, Social and Policy Sciences at the University of Bath. Welcome to you both. You. Hisham, let me first ask you, um, uh, what impact did the arrest have on you as somebody who'd already been involved, in a sense, in campaigning and, and uh, student rights matters? What what were your first feelings when you were arrested for this um, alleged terrorism con uh, connection? Well, I've already said about the, the immediate feelings uh, were of complete, um, I mean, I guess the word is shock uh, in, in the sense of it didn't make any sense at all. And the thing people need to really sort of realize is that when you get arrested for something you haven't done, um, it can be quite disturbing experience in the sense of it's really hard to have an idea about what it is and it could be Kafkaesque in the sense of you have no idea where even to begin in terms of trying to guess what the, especially when it comes to terrorism, the rule usually is that you're not told what the offence is until much later. Now you're a Muslim of Algerian background, do you think that this had any part to play in why you were targeted or why, or was it simply that uh, the contents of the, the document that you were involved in in copying was simply too much for some scrupulous or unscrupulous uh, um, other lecturer or person, staff member, uh, to, to recognise that this is simply, um, this is just too much. But you can never know what people's intentions are, um, for sure, 100%. But it's really hard for me and for most people I've spoken to and who have really taught, spoke about this, to imagine a situation in which this document uh, being discovered by a white, um, blonde, uh, you know, say female member of staff would have had the same impact. It's clear to my view and to most people who have really sort of commented on this that it had a huge part. And, you know, one can see why, you know, the, some someone's reaction to finding this document might have been to be alarmed. Uh, but I think it's uh, it goes a lot beyond this in terms of how the hierarchy of the university, for example, dealt with it. 
No, no. no. Now, you were, became a later an easier target, in a sense, because of being a, a foreign national in the UK uh, for, for the uh, authorities here. But I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, Rizwan Sabir, you're the culprit, of course. You're the one who went about um, getting the Al-Qaeda training manual copied. What were you playing at? Um, before my arrest, I, I operated on the basic principle that this is a liberal democracy in which individuals, regardless of their ethnicity or religion or creed, were entitled to look into an, an issue such as terrorism and to try and help counter a problem that existed in society. And so and what was it that you were actually looking into? What were you researching? I was looking at the trying to understand uh, how ideology of two political Islamic organizations in this context, Hamas and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, how that affected the tactics that they employed. Why did one use suicide bombing and why did the other one use you know, targeted assassination, for example? And I take it that your lecturers and everybody who, who, who was following your study knew exactly what you were doing and, and uh, what you were... Th there, were there were individuals uh, mm -hmm. uh, at university in academic positions, including mm -hmm. supervisors, who were looking over and I was in consultation and discussion with them as to the area of work that I was looking so at. So here you are, this student who, of course, um, and we've met before prior to that when, when you were uh, um, collecting for Oxfam, of all um, <laughs> radical Islamic organisations. Sure. Um, but then uh, this happens to you and you get arrested and somebody, of course, shops you. Uh, um, you, you, were a, you were a staff member at the time. What is that like? Uh, uh, in, it's almost like you're studying something, but even that now is, is, is too much for some people to, to recognise as study. What goes through your mind then? That's because the reality is that in modern Britain today, um, we are all free until we are proven to be Muslim. And the moment you are classed as a Muslim or, or you are a Muslim and you say you're a Muslim and you're in possession of something that you can purchase from Blackstones and, and W. H. Smiths for 1999, um, the reality is that you're viewed with suspicion because naturally you're suspected because you're a Muslim, that you have the potential of becoming a terrorist, which is why you have wider counter-terrorism programs such as Preventing Violent Extremism or PREVENT that target all Muslims because all Muslims are considered to be a potential threat. And now in our case it shows that we had this open source document, but because the university failed in its duty, um, which it had to follow according to internal statutes and external governmental guidance, um, they picked up the phone and rang the police because for them, it was just too suspect that two individuals or one individual had a copy of a document. And Both it just shows... Both Muslims. Yeah, two Muslims or one Muslim in the, in the first context, mm -hmm. and then I was arrested when I was asking about right. Hisham, um, was that why have these Muslims got this document? Uh, and so when the police interrogated you and questioned you, which they held you, I think, for six days? Seven, seven days. Seven days um, under the Anti-Terror uh, Act. What were they asking you? They, they, were, they were, I mean, for example, one interview was spent entirely uh, discussing my PhD proposal. So my application process and what I'd written in and my, you know, the concepts, the, the academic concepts that I would be researching and examining and looking into, it was a complete farce. It was a waste of time. There were 26 police officers, from my understanding, that were involved in the actual investigation that cost in excess of £50,000. So that's just figures from the West Midlands Counterterrorism Unit that I have. Uh, but Nottinghamshire Police, who oversaw the operation in terms of logistics, spent thousands and thousands of pounds on investigating us, and frankly, there was nothing to investigate. They were trying to find something that would allow a charge to stick, because when you undertake a counterterrorism operation, it's a deeply, deeply political act, which carries a lot of political aspects and has a lot of political aspects that you need to justify your own existence and what you've done. So they were looking for anything that would stick. Uh, but, of course, the students responded uh, to that political act. And I remember coming to Nottingham University uh, w when the arrests had happened and uh, the students there uh, mounted an unprecedented campaign, I think, in the UK. Um, they, 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 they marched with their mouths taped to, to, to show uh, that academic freedom here is being silenced. Hisham, at that time, I remember, um, I came and, and you had been detained uh, I think it was in Colbrook Detention Centre, uh, and you phoned in, uh, and uh, over the mic, uh, your words were heard. What did that feel like? What had you gone through? Well, I remember that day, because I remember when we had that conversation, um, I had in my hand a piece of paper that said that I would be deported from the country within seven days. So just let's get, let's get this right. You had been arrested under the anti-terror uh, legislation. Uh, there was no charge against you, but then they re-arrested you uh, on immigration matters, they said, 
but your immigration papers were already up to date. And what, what, what do you think, when they spoke to you, when the police spoke to you, what did they say to you? Well, I mean, the initial arrest was on terror uh, charges um, or terror suspicion. Mm -hmm. And clearly they discovered very, very quickly that they had made a huge mistake. They had jumped to conclusions because these were two Muslim men and they thought they had something. They discovered quickly that they had made a huge fuss about something that could have been resolved within five minutes if they had just been patient and asked what any person would ask you know, uh, of their colleagues and so on. And when they discovered this, it was clear that they had decided to try and sort of find a way out by finding something suspicious. And in, their, in this case, because I was a, a, an Algerian national, um, the rights I have compared to a British national were a lot, a lot less, um, to, to put it mildly. And, and, and you eventually won your case in, in 2010 against the Home Office, which was a, a, a great source of joy, obviously, to you. But the experience had, uh, in a sense, um, I'm, I'm sure, traumatized you, scarred you. Why did you continue then uh, with activism, activism and become the editor of, of Ceasefire magazine, which is very, very political in its, in its um, out outset? The, sh the short answer is very simply that had I not done that, had I decided <coughs> to, I mean, I had been an activist and I've been involved in writing and, and in uh, getting involved in, in you know, campaigns and so on for almost a decade before my arrest. Uh, since so you were quite well known in the university, I remember. Indeed, but yes. People I mean, I was a member, I'm a founding member of the uh, Nottingham Peace Movement, for example, among other societies, and I was always, you know, a known presence on campus as somebody who's a peace activist. So mm -hmm. uh, that sort of heightened the, the feelings of injustice on campus about my arrest, because people thought, if this person um, is arrested on terrorism, then nobody is safe. Uh, this is a feeling especially felt by many Muslim students in Nottingham who felt extremely uncomfortable and unsafe on campus because they felt they were officially, just by being Muslims, uh, official targets. And no, no it, it's, it's really important, I think, because your case, the case of both of you, is something that I think that people, when they look in this country, most, most of the time when somebody's arrested under anti-terror legislation matters, uh, they pretty much go underground whether they're released without charge or not. Both of you have taken very active, proactive roles. You in the campaigning through the Ceasefire magazine and you through your, uh, your, your doctoral studies in, in, uh, in, in policy, counter-terror legislation and so forth. Uh, what motivates you, Rizwan, to continue in this work? And um, didn't you think after, the, after your, your little test and trial that you'd go on to other things? The truthful answer is, is being in a position of powerlessness, which is what I felt. And being powerless is, is an incredible feeling. Like if you've ever been in a position where you just, where your life will now be determined by individuals that have no incentive to support you or to help you, that's what I felt. And I don't ever want to be put in a position again or allow anybody else to be put in a position again where they are innocent and they are powerless to do anything and to affect change or to protect themselves and to defend themselves. Um, so that's what made me do what I, what I do. Um, I know that what happened to me was wrong. I believe it was wrong. Um, I, I, you know, I held the police to account when I won my legal case in September 2011 uh, and won my damages and, and all the rest of it, which took three and a half years to get to. So it was that personal vindication achieved, but also at the same time there's a wider responsibility. But being in a position where you felt so powerless um, kind of put the onus on me to think, right, now what do you do? How do you challenge this? How do you prevent other people um, from being subjected to this? And I, I took the responsibility on. I wish others would come out and take it on with me um, because I don't think enough people do it. Hopefully after we're watching this, uh, many people will. Uh, it's also important, I think, that f when I look at both of you, um, you're not the usual suspects, are you? you you're not, uh, if, am I correct to say, you, you wouldn't count yourself as Islamists in terms of your, your approach and so forth. Uh, you're not part of any of the radical groups or, or, or so forth. Um, and just just for the record, I've never been part of any organization in my life. No organization, whether it's left wing or Islamist or, or conservative, nothing. I'm totally mm -hmm. independent. Yeah, and, and so Hisham, uh, and I've clearly seen how you are you know, in, on campus with all the, all the support you had with people over there. Uh, you're just a people's guy. Uh, you're friends with everybody. Um, how, 
how has this been for you in terms of how did you feel when when you got the support that you did from all across the, the campus and then uh, and then uh, 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 in, in the wider sense across the country what did that make you feel like it was i mean of course it was incredible and at the time um you know like rizwan said the feeling of being powerless uh, was very very heightened when uh, like i said i was in a cell on the phone to these uh, to 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 act, you know, hundreds of students who came together to try and sort of um, raise the alarm and to to say n no to injustice and i think people really need to be aware of the fact that had it not been for this campaign had it not been for the decision by hundreds of people to come together and to put a stop to this uh, i wouldn't be here certainly uh, on this in this studio, I wouldn't be here in the country. And of course, you had people like uh, Professor Rod uh, Thornton, um, who had been campaigning for you uh, when this happened. He's a university lecturer in, at Nottingham, Nottingham. But then uh, a couple of years ago, something happened. Can you just tell well, me I mean, the details Rod, of that? Rod Thornton wasn't necessarily campaigning. He mm -hmm. was uh, pursuing uh, internal complaints, mechanisms and mm -hmm. avenues to try and understand what had happened and to try and hold, bring some accountability to those that had made erroneous uh, judgments and decisions. And um, the reality is that British universities, um, including in Northern Ireland, are utterly unaccountable bodies. There is no body or institution in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that can hold a, a university to account. They are totally autonomous university institutions that can do as they wish. Well, why do you say this? because we've tried to hold them to account through absolutely every single organization that exists. So, so let me get this straight. The, did the police apologize to you? No. But they did, uh, you did win your case against them. Yes. They paid uh, tens of thousands of pounds in damages to you. Uh, they wouldn't do that if they knew, uh, if they didn't yeah, They can accept spin how they like, but yes. the reality is that they accepted the fact that they'd done wrong. Uh, and yet the university, have they uh, responded to you? Because surely it was the university was the reason why both of you got arrested. Um, has there been a response from the university? The university's response has been quite simple. They, they, they failed to address any of the points that Rod Thornton mentioned. Um, there's allegations that they manipulated my uh, MA dissertation um, uh, marks um, in order to remove me from the institution. Then there was a massive campaign, um, some kind of undercover campaign to try and get rid of us and to get rid of me. And eventually I had to leave the university because my position became untenable. So in the end, that, what I think is a very important uh, um, project you were studying about the differences in the ideology and methodology of Hamas and Al-Qaeda, and they are very different if you want to understand sure. today's world, um, you never got to finish that. No. But then you went on then to study um, the people making the policies that allowed you for you to be detained in the way that you did. What have you discovered? I've discovered that this country has a, um, a reading list in play, uh, which if you are caught in possession of those books, you will find yourself subject to investigation and inquiry. Um, that's not public because the police, for political reasons, can't ban books. Now, personally, I think they should ban those books. Because if you have a book available to purchase in W. H. Smith for nine ninety nine, sorry, um, are you saying the Al Qaeda manual is, is available? Oh in, yeah, it's in, not nine ninety nine; it's nineteen ninety nine in oh, W. H. Smith's. Okay, so, um, so it, you, can you can actually it. purchase this. As in oh a, yeah, from the university. And, book am shop. I right in saying that the one that you had uh, was downloaded from the U. S. Department of Defense uh, website? It was one hundred and forty pages, which is a lot shorter mm -hmm. and has chapters missing than the one you can buy in W. H. Smith's. So the explosive chapter, for example, wasn't included on the one hundred and forty page document that I downloaded, but the W. H. Smith one has the full version. It has all the chapters. But th this is the reality, that this mm -hmm. country has a series of policies, so it allows books to be sold, then when Muslims read those books or are found in possession, but you have to be a Muslim to fall foul of them, then, then you're arrested, because the police can't go around banning books, because the white middle classes and the liberal classes would be up in arms. You know, the, the iconic imagery of the Nazis burning books is the same when you stop banning books. So what they do is to prevent any kind of political criticism, they allow all books because nobody reads them, and when you do decide to read them as a Muslim because you're interested or curious to understand what this campaign is throughout the world, the mm -hmm. war on terror, mm -hmm. and you start looking and that curiosity gets the better of you, you're arrested, sweeped yeah. up, and you're imprisoned. Uh, Hisham, uh, I, I want to know about, you're still very much involved on campus, uh, you, you are doing the uh, um, editing for the, um, the ceasefire magazine, which is very student orientated. Uh, tell me, are there any cases that are resonant of what happened with you and Rizwan that have happened since that time around the country? 
Yes, I mean, uh, I have to, in answer to, uh, I think I didn't answer your question properly the first time around, which is that the reason why I'm doing things like continuing with ceasefire and the journalism that I do and the the, the involvement in, in politics and, and, and culture that I do is uh, is because if I didn't, then uh, that would be an admission, that would be the, the absolutely the wrong answer to what happened to us. Because I think it's very important to say, we don't want the the, the forces of of, um, of reaction of uh, you know the, the 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 this this culture of fear uh, that's been enforced that that's been um, that Muslims are subjected to we, uh, you know trying to say you're not going to win you're not going to win this this war of intimidation against Muslims and, do and you that's feel intimidated now? well I mean it's, you know I'm I'm very lucky because I had a very very strong network of support which I still have mm -hmm. um, I'm very lucky because I had a certain level of education which a lot of people who are subjected to these laws right. do not have uh, they're a lot more most people are very vulnerable and they usually get completely crushed by by stories and events that happen of the same nature that happened to us. Mm. And for example, in 2009, you probably remember the case of the 13 Pakistani students who got arrested. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost in Liverpool and Manchester. Yes, yes. The, the Northwest End. Yes, and they, yes. these, these people, uh, it's an almost carbon copy uh, case of what happened to us. Mm -hmm. The only difference, of course, is that these guys were in the country for a fairly short period of time, didn't develop any sort of network of right. solidarity, right. which meant that the a same trick was tried on them. They were taken, arrested. They found nothing on, in terms of terrorism, but they discovered they were Pakistani nationals and therefore put them in detention centers, in immigration detention centers, mm -hmm. and forced them to stay there under the guise of having broken some sort of immigration rules until most of them gave up because they just didn't have anywhere Support, to go yeah. and accepted to be right. deported back to Pakistan. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's so important to, to note because what you had managed to do is to build up such a strong support. I remember there were so many events taking place and being on the national and, and, and international news and so forth, and that, that made a, a big difference. I just want to, before we, we finish, the time's running out, but uh, Rizwan and, and you, uh, myself too, in fact, um, constantly and regularly get stopped. You've been stopped... How many times since? Uh, in one year, I was stopped 13 times. This is just one year, 13 times sorry, in 12 months. Sorry, I, I was talking uh, particularly in relation to it coming in and out of the country, but you're talking about stop and search uh, under the Terrorism Act here in the UK. Uh, Terrorism Act has been a lot less restricted, and notably mm -hmm. it's, it's happened once on the street for which I got an apology and damages okay. uh, for a stop and search mm -hmm. as part of my legal settlement. Um, and then I was, I've been stopped at points of entry and exit. For example, I have information from uh, reliable information in writing, I have evidence um, that in July 2010, when I was coming back from Spain, uh, a put, something called a port circular was issued on me um, to suggest to the police officers, Leicestershire Special Branch, that they should intercept me as I arrive into the but arrivals You seem lounge. to take all this in your stride. You seem, you seem to kind of now expect this and, and say, well, bring it on almost. Well, you need to bring it on because the reality is most police officers are too stupid to realise without without any disrespect to them. They don't understand the wider policy implications and why they're being told to do this because they don't question. And that's the first sign you've got to make them question that what they're doing is it right or wrong. And, uh, you know, some of your viewers might be offended by what I've just said or called police officers stupid. But as someone who's been dealing with them now for four years, a lot of them, I've, I've I actually... I pity a lot of them because they don't realise the complexity of the issues that they're dealing with and the effects that it has. And it's their responsibility <coughs> as police officers that they should understand. And that's what I now to try to do, to try to educate them and try to explain to them that this is a wider policy. And to an extent, it works. To an extent, it works. H H Hisham, uh, you've had all of these years of experience. What advice would you give to people who are in the similar circumstances, who feel constrained by who they are, uh, but have not the experience or the knowledge, what would you tell them to do in, in terms of trying to fight for the campaign and, uh, or the rights of, of those who are in similar situations? Well, I mean, it depends on people's positions <coughs> and circumstances, but the general rule really is to say to people, do not be afraid, um, because if you don't speak up for your rights, and certainly if you don't speak up for the rights of others who are more vulnerable than you, then, you know, then, then basically this is your, your letting people take your rights away from you. And I say this to most to the viewers who are Muslim and to people who think they are in a vulnerable position, solidarity is really important. If you hear of a case, if you know of people who are in difficulties, who are being uh, put under pressure, who are scared about who they are and about being suspected, you need to show support, you need to build networks of solidarity because when things happen, when people need help, um, it's important to have the community gather around them and, and show them support. And it's really important also.
to notice, I mean, to echo what Rizwan said about the police um, competence, it's impo uh, you get a lot of people sort of saying it's better to be saved than sorry. And what what is, uh, you know, the, the, there's no harm in people sort of being arrested if it's simply to find out whether there's something to it and they get released. Um, that's not the case. People need to know, for example, that our arrest was based on me and Rizwan showing up at the premises and therefore this is how we got arrested. It wasn't people coming to find us. And had we been real terrorists, they would never have been in a position to do so. In other words, uh, this hardline attempt to try and sort of really okay. put pressure on Muslims never works. It doesn't work. It's not that, you know, safety. It actually means less freedom, but without an increase in safety. Okay. And Unfortunately, um, that's all we have time for this week. Uh, the last word is the word of solidarity. Uh, for those who uh, are in similar positions. I'd like to thank uh, my guests, the production staff, and you at home for watching. Remember, Absent Justice is a fortnightly program, so I will see you again in two weeks' time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.